County calling Unit 4. My radio chirped. 4, I responded. Unit 4, respond code to a one-car motor vehicle accident. Old route 33 in the area, a mile marker 44. Caller states that he hit a deer. Vehicle inoperable. I sighed and put down my phone. Putting my Chevy Tahoe in gear and gently pulling out of the parking lot I was comfortably sitting in. Unit 4 copies are responding. I said into the radio, putting it back in its holder. Roger, Unit 4. Time of dispatch, 2.39. Working third shift had its perks. Slow nights and not much to do. Especially in such a rural county here in Montana, where the only crime seemed to be boredom. Having been born and raised here, I knew this area like the back of my hand. I could navigate it in the dark, heck, blindfolded, and I could tell you exactly where I was solely from the ground that I was standing on. Not much really happened to note here. The people kept to themselves. They were friendly, humble, and kind. Some people worked in the city close by, but most worked on their farms. They were hunters, homebodies, people who preferred their own solitude rather than the hustle and bustle of bigger cities and towns. The county that I worked in as a deputy sheriff was large. So large, in fact, that it took over an hour just to get from one side of my patrol route to the other. Man, it didn't bother me. And since most people here owned firearms, break-ins and property crimes were seldom. Our job was mostly to wrangle up the drunks at closing time and chase the cows that always seemed to wander out of their pastures. Tonight seemed to be no different. A passing motorist hit a deer. It's quite common, really, especially with the large amount of space between houses and people. Animals pretty much had free roam in this place. But I had come to learn quickly. Tonight wasn't like most nights. Tonight would show me that solitude, while it often brings peace, can also bring horrors untold. The red and blue lights of my Tahoe pierced through the moonlit sky, while the terrain changed from asphalt to gravel and to dirt. Old Route 33 was never paved. The county maintained it but decided to keep the tradition of dirt, same as how our settlers had traveled back in the day. The bumpy road shuffled me in my seat, making me groan with each bump. I passed a mile marker six. I still had a long way to go before reaching the motorist. Reaching for the stereo, I winced as the usual station I listened to was only an ear-piercing static. Weird, I thought to myself. Reception usually stays until at least a marker 20. I thought nothing of it, turning off the radio and instead listening to the gravel and dirt pushed from underneath my tires. The headlights of the SUV pushed far ahead, along with the flashing lights on the roof of my patrol car, giving me a clear view of what was ahead. I didn't go too fast, I mean, after all, how far could an inoperable car really go? It'll still be there when I get there, and besides, the last thing I need is to hit an animal and ruin my car, trying to get to him in the first place. I sighed and leaned back in my seat, wishing that morning would come and I could fall asleep. The miles kept coming, passing mile marker 17, not even halfway there. If it weren't for the constant shaking and rumbling of the loose stone and rocks beneath the car, I would have easily drifted off. The road, as straight as an arrow, kept going and going. And going. Wait... Since when was that tree on the side of the road? I asked myself. A white birch tree, beautiful and standing tall, was always on the west side of the road. It was one of the few trees on the road. But tonight, it was on the east side. I slowed my cruiser to a stop, checking the GPS on the windshield. No, I'm heading southbound. I said softly to myself. That tree was never on that side. 
I sat there looking at the tree. It was the same one I had my first kiss under. It was the same tree I lost my virginity under. But why was it there? Huh, must be the lack of sleep, I chuckled to myself, pushing down the accelerator slightly. Although I played it off as nothing, the thought still creeped into my head. Why was that there? There were very few trees on this road. Heck, it was known as the rolling road for a reason. You could see for miles on end on either side. Not an obstruction in sight. The road continued on. Light still shining in front of me. I chuckled. I really need to get a decent sleep schedule, I said to myself, shaking my head to keep the sleep away. I passed mile marker 15. Wait, that can't be right. I just passed 19. I said to myself, stopping my cruiser and backing up. The sign said mile marker 20. The heck, I whispered to myself. I put my cruiser back in drive and I pulled forward, shaking my head once more at what I saw or at least what I thought I saw. I was getting worried. I know working the hours I did would at some point start taking a toll on me, but why now? I've been working third shift for over three years. I've kept myself caffeinated. There is no reason my brain would fog twice like that in one night. I looked at the clock on the dashboard. 3.03. I still had three hours left in my shaft, and I knew that as soon as I got home, I would be sleeping. Marker 22, all right, halfway there, I whispered to myself. Generally, I was a pretty stoic man, and growing up in a military family meant fear wasn't really an option, and emotions weren't either. So, when I was scared, it was answered with anger and disapproval. Sighing, I kept trudging down the road, keeping tabs on to the miles ahead, hoping the time would pass faster to clear this call and to get the heck off this road and into bed. Another mile marker sign was coming up. 29. I was getting closer, thankfully. But it didn't read mile marker 29. Rather, it was missing. The stump of the missing sign was there. The pole still stood, but the sign was missing. I pulled my cruiser to a stop and got out, shining my flashlight on it. Unit 4, Calvin County, I said with a sigh. There was no answer, which was weird. Each patrol car had a radio repeater in it, which made sure we could always be in contact with dispatch. I checked my radio. It was on and the channel was right. There's no reason I shouldn't be hearing back. Unit 4, Calvin County, I said again this time in a more aggressive tone. No response once more. I pulled up my phone but saw there was no cell service. Again, this was weird, since there were towers sporadic through the fields, making sure people had contact even in the most desolate locations here. Nevertheless, I took a picture of the sign, making a note in the phone to call Public Works and let them know one of their signs was gone. Probably some kids, I thought to myself. I looked at the photo, making sure it wasn't blurry or anything. But something caught my eye, and two glowing orbs were seen in the far back of the photo. I was shaking, and lifted my flashlight to where the orbs were in the photo. My flashlight was powerful, shining far into the darkened night, far into the field. But I saw nothing. It was empty. And that's another thing, it was quiet. Very, very quiet. Even at night, you could hear the crickets, the low murmur of a resting animal, even the soft shuffle of an insect moving. It was that quiet. Tonight, the only sound was the low hum of the idling engine. I looked at the photo once more and back into the field. Maybe it was just a reflection. 
Maybe the side holes produced those from the flash I reasoned with myself. Surely there is an explanation. I didn't want to stay longer than I had to. I got back into my cruiser and tried the police radio once more. Unit 4 calling county, I said nervously. I heard a crackle, better than nothing but still. No response came from the dispatchers. I switched the channel to the one that the state police used. They had a barracks in our county and they helped us on calls from time to time. Deputy Steele calling state police, any trooper on the air. I said into the radio. No response. An eerie silence once more filled the car. That's not right. I said, double checking to make sure I had the right channel. I didn't yet, no one answered. Now I was scared. But still, I had a call to respond to. Putting it back in drive, I kept moving down the road. Dread filling me as I drove further away from civilization. Mile marker 33, 34, and 35. I was making good progress, and everything was normal. I chuckled to myself, knowing that I was working myself up for nothing. At night, people get scared. People fear the dark. You can't blame them for that. See, I was told it wasn't the dark that we fear, rather, what could be in the dark. But with two bright headlights and enough emergency lights to rival 30 Christmas trees, darkness it was no match. And yet, why could I barely see the road in front of me? The previous mile marker signs came from what seemed like nowhere, whereas they should have been illuminated pretty far from my headlights, even at a good distance. I came up on mile marker 36, the sign like the previous, appearing from what seemed like out of nowhere. But what caught me off guard this time was a crudely painted 66 right after the first one. I stopped the cruiser and got out a sign. Dang kids, haha, ha, funny funny, I said to myself. I snapped another photo of the sign. Do I dare look at it? Do another set of orbs await me? I needed to make sure it was a good photo for my report. And thankfully, no mysterious balls of light greeted me from the screen. I sighed and put my phone back in my uniform pocket, looking at the vandalized sign. I crouched down looking at the crudely spray-painted sign. Wait, that's... that's not spray paint. I said, looking at it closer. Was that what I think it is? Spray paint isn't that thick. It isn't that drippy. Unless it was fresh. I reached out a finger daringly, and I touched it. It didn't smell like paint, no. It smelled of iron. Unit 4 calling county, requesting assistance. I said nervously, begging, no praying for an answer. Alas, none would come. And I was met with yet again the silence of the night. The temperature was dropping rapidly. And even though this was quite possibly a crime scene, I had to reach that stranded motorist. If his car truly wasn't working, he could get hypothermia in there. I looked at my watch, making sure to note the time for the report. 303. That can't be, I said to myself, completely befuddled that no time had passed. I had crossed miles of land, miles that should have taken me at least 15 minutes to get to where I was when I had last checked the time. I shook my watch, tapping on the screen. The time, it didn't change. My phone said the same, 303. I stood up and quickly walked back to the patrol car, getting in and shutting the door. The dashboard clock said the same, 303. Slamming the cruiser in gear, I floored the pedal, the roar of the engine shredding the otherwise quiet ride. I had to make it to the motorist. I had to get the heck out of here. I wasn't sleeping anymore. Adrenaline pumped through my body and fear riddled my bones. Darkness, silence, fear. 
three perfect ingredients for a horror movie. And yet, this was real. It was raw and it was happening to me. The mile signs flew by me. 37, 38, 39, 40. I was at 40. And I only had four more miles to go. At 60 miles per hour, even though the road wasn't suited for the speed, it would let me reach the car in four minutes. That's all I needed before seeing another human. Four minutes. I let out a sigh of relief. I could do this. I was close. I was going to make it. Through the darkness came a shape. A shape that was in the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes. The wheels hurling gravel and dirt all around me while the figure came into view. My breath was arrhythmic, chest tight and heart pounding. A deer. A freaking deer. I laughed to myself, taking a deep inhale. Come on, I laughed, running a hand through my hair. You scared me. The deer was facing me. His tall antlers reflecting slightly against the headlights and emergency lights of my patrol car. I blew up the siren and yet, he didn't move. He kept his stare straight at me, not moving. Alright, come on buddy, I said, turning on the siren for a few seconds. Again, he didn't move, staying still. Literally, a deer in headlights. I laughed, putting the cruiser in park and getting out. Come on, buddy. Mush. Go. I bellowed. He didn't move. Nor did his eyes. I was a hunter. I've known plenty of deer that can spot a human hundreds of feet away. The slightest sound could scare them off. Yet the siren, nor my yelling, scared him. I took two steps forward, hand on my pistol and getting closer to it. Buddy, hey... I whispered to it, making a clicking noise with my tongue to try to get its attention. The deer stayed staring at my headlights, unmoving, unshaken. Stepping heel to toe, making as little noise as possible, I approached the animal. I was mere feet from it, and yet he didn't move. I reached out and I touched it. Cold, very cold. Fur was warm even after it's dead. The fur is always warm. I reached to pat its side to get it to move away. With an open hand, I gently patted the side of the deer. Go, I bellowed. He didn't move. He fell over as stiff as a board, bouncing a bit as he hit the ground. He was dead. Shaking, panting, I stepped backwards, shaking my head. What is going on? I asked myself loudly, looking around me. I looked up and knew that I had to go. The moon and stars that filled the night sky were gone. It was black, like the moon was never a thing, like stars had ceased to shine. This wasn't normal. It was a clear night only an hour ago, and the forecast was supposed to be clear. I took another look at the deer still laying lifeless on the ground in front of my patrol car. With a shaky hand, I opened the door to my police car, getting back in and shutting it. Slamming it back in drive, I floored it, moving around the dead deer and racing down the road. There has to be an explanation for that, I thought to myself. It couldn't have just died right there. My thoughts were racing, Desperate to come up with a reason why a deer would have died standing up in the middle of the road. 41, okay, I'm getting closer. Three more, three more. I panted to myself, stealing myself to reality. Come on, man up. I shook myself, getting myself back into it, shaking away the fear and the worry from inside, pacing my breathing to get it normal again. Sighing in relief, I pushed my head against the headrest, still looking out ahead. Get a grip, I whispered to myself, slamming the palm of my hand on the steering wheel. Speeding down the bumpy road, 
I got closer and closer, the mile marker signs growing in number. Mile marker 44. I was there, but still I saw no car, no flashing lights, no sign of an accident. I slowed my speed and I reached for the radio. Unit 4 called in county, I said into the radio. Not to my surprise, there was no answer. Figuring that I should keep talking, maybe for my own sanity, or maybe that someone could hear me, and I just couldn't hear them. Unit 4 calling county, show me in the area of the accident, searching at this time. I put the radio back into its holder, shining the spotlight into the darkness around me, looking to see if the car veered off the road. Other than pitch black, there was nothing. No vehicle, no dead animal, just pitch black. The SUV kept moving forward, although slow, fast enough to try to find this motorist. I wasn't sure if I was more excited to be done with this call, or just to know other humans are actually real. And with the events that had transpired so far, I was skeptical. More dirt, more darkness, and more fear. I had to be getting close now. The next mile marker sign had to be coming up. I shined the spotlight ahead of me and finally, I found it. One car, hazard lights on in the rear, brake lights shining. I could almost cry I was so happy to have finally found it, let alone finding another human. Unit 4 calling county, code 6 with the vehicle, I said into the radio. Why bother, I thought to myself. They ain't responding to you anyway. No response, but no bother. I put the cruiser in park and got out. I shined my flashlight at the car, stepping quietly and slowly towards it. Like gray smoke billowed from the engine block, damaged from the struck animal. Sheriff's Department, I bellowed. I stepped closer, moving my hand to my holster, pushing down the hood and putting my thumb on the release. Sheriff's Department, I bellowed again. I stepped closer, shining my flashlight into the car. There was a man laying in the front seat, head rolled back against the headrest. Sir, sir, do you need any help? I asked, taking my hand off my gun and rushed into the driver's side door. I kept my flashlight shined on him, noting his eyes were clenched shut. I took a good look at the man. His face was covered in red, his hands too. His breathing turned rapid again taking my eyes off of him for a second to look at the front of the car. There was no deer, but dang, there was a lot of red. Too much for any animal to survive. I wanted to take a closer look, but was startled by the man in the front seat. I snapped back to him, shining the flashlight at him. Sir, I'm with the sheriff's department. Are you alright? I asked him, leaning down. The man's eyes snapped open, and I gasped. There was no pupil, no iris, white like the moon that still didn't shine. A red hand opened the door, nails scratching against the plastic of the handle. Taking a step back, my hand found my holster again, thumbing at the release. Sir, I think you need an ambulance, I said, trying to keep composed. The door swung open, and I gulped. The hand that opened the door was frail, white like a ghost. The nails were longer than daggers, pointed at the end and covered in red. I brought the light back up to the man as he stepped out, growing, growing, and growing. He towered over me, at least seven feet tall. The flashlight illuminated his body. Tattered clothes stained in red and other substances I prayed weren't human. His legs shook like a newborn deer, covered only by jeans that didn't fit, standing barefoot in front of me. I took another step back, hand on my gun and another on the light. Hey, you've been in an accident. I think you need to sit down, I said. His head snapped left, right, up and down almost inhuman in how fast he made them. His neck snapped to me, 
these soulless eyes somehow pierced through me, shaking me to my core. Sir, I stammered. And then he smiled. The teeth. The teeth weren't human. They were sharp, sharp like shark teeth. They weren't neatly in rows, nor did they have any semblance of structure. And by God, they were stained in red and what looked to be bone and muscle. What the heck? I whispered to myself. He took a step forward, and I took a step back, stumbling but holding myself. Stop, I beckoned, ordering him, although my voice faltered. The man, dare I say man, but the man stopped and looked at me with those white eyes. He opened his mouth, and it unhinged like a snake. Rows and rows of more red stained teeth shined through my light, and a howl of ungodly noises pierced through the night. The thing brought its head back and cried out louder, making a noise that I'd never heard of before. I took another step back and fell over, landing hard on my back. The thing's head snapped down to me, an evil grin spreading across his mouth that was way too big for his face. One step, two steps, three steps. Stop, I said loudly. Four steps. He was getting closer. Stop, I bellowed again, but he didn't. It didn't. I unholstered my gun and pointed it at him. He didn't stop. I know that he saw my gun. He had to have. Most people would have stopped at the sight of it, but he... It, whatever the heck it was, it didn't. The thing just took another step towards me. The cracking of its bones and body made me shiver in terror. My gun was shaking in my hand, finger resting on the trigger guard. I'll shoot. Stop where you are. I bellowed, getting up on one knee. Once more, the man rolled his head back, letting out another guttural scream, making my head hurt and my ears ring. The neck of the man snapped back down. An unholy noise came through as his eyes locked onto mine. One step, this time faster, closing the distance. I put my finger on the trigger and squeezed. The gunshot echoed through the night. The sharp recoil stinging my cold hand and the hot shell bounced on the ground next to me. I saw it hit him center mass and yet... He only stumbled. He took two steps back and he chuckled. The man chuckled. I stood up now knowing that I had distance and tried to backpedal back towards my car. Another noise from him and those teeth. God, those teeth. He was now in a full sprint. I squeezed the trigger again, dropping my flashlight to get a better grip on my gun opting to turn in the flashlight mounted on it. Three, four, five, all center mass on him, and he only laughed and screamed in that noise that made my body turn cold. The man has stumbled back, looking down at his chest. There was no red from where I shot him. I could see the holes and I could see where my rounds had landed, and yet there was nothing. Forget this, I whispered to myself finally making it back to the hood of my police car. I leaned against the ram bar while the man charged at me again, not stopping, only lulling his head back and letting out another screech. With ringing ears and two unsteady hands, I fired again and again and again, pushing him back with each round that hit his torso. The gun snapped back and I pulled the trigger again, but nothing came out. A quick look over at my gun determined, I had fired the entire magazine, all 18 rounds and yet he didn't go down. He still stood there flashing those razor sharp and red covered teeth. I dropped the magazine, quickly slapping in a new one and releasing the slide, backpedaling towards my cruiser and getting in. Slamming the door, I put the cruiser in reverse, not daring to take my eyes off of whatever the heck was in front of me. Even through the roar of the engine, the man's screams appears through, making me wince and shut my eyes to try to dull the sound. 
The dirt kicked up from my cruiser clouded the sight of him, using this time to spin the cruiser around and for the pedal, not caring the damage that I was doing to the car. I kept looking in my rearview, and the only thing I saw was the cloud of dust and the emergency lights reflecting off of it. The cruiser buckled in shock, making noises I knew weren't good for it, but I knew that I had to get out of there. Mile marker 45. No, no, I had turned my car around. Those numbers shouldn't be going up, they should be going down. Mile marker 4666. I was shaking, panting, terrified like I've never felt before, punishing the cruiser as I sped through the night. The mirror showed nothing, only dust. I had to have lost it by now. I had to have. Mile marker, hell. Tears clouded my vision. I wiped them away quickly, trying to keep my eyes on the road. The GPS showed I was going northbound. I was going the right way to go home, and yet the landscape proved otherwise. Mile marker 40. I was going the right way. I sighed in relief, but didn't dare to slow my pace, keeping me pedal floored in the engine roaring. The deer was gone, nowhere to be seen where it lay when I came by earlier. I know that was the spot and yet, it's as if the deer had simply got up and left right after I did. Shaking my head and wiping more tears, I kept moving, passing mile markers that finally showed the right numbers. Mile marker 30. I was getting closer, free from whatever place I had just wandered into. What the heck? What the heck? I bellowed, slamming my palm onto the steering wheel. My watch lit up. It was still 3.03. Sobbing and shaking, I kept going and keeping my handgun in the passenger seat for easy access. God forbid that thing appeared again. There was the tree, the tree from earlier, and now it was on the right side of the road. How did it just move like that? That was on the other side of the road. It can't be. Pull it together, Steel, pull it together, I said to myself doing my best to calm down while the road kept going on and on in front of me. A light. I saw a light. A quick peek through the windshield showed the moon and stars shining bright like they were before. I was getting closer to the main road. I had to make it. The SUV buckled under the dip in the road. Items were thrown all around the cabin as the car lurched back but it kept steady. Here we go, here we go, we got this, I whispered to myself, reassuring myself that I would see the end of this. There it was, the asphalt road, the old sign that showed old Route 33. I made it, and as soon as the tires connected to the asphalt, I didn't dare look back, the same as I didn't dare to let my foot off the accelerator. Cars passed by, pulling over from my red and blues while I sped down the road. I let out a shaky breath, pulling into a gas station and shutting off the lights. Pulling around back, I put the car in park, crying tears of pain and joy, knowing that I had made it back to safety. County, calling Unit 4. The radio called out. I sniffled, so happy to hear the voice again. Any voice, really. Go, go ahead. I stammered through the tears. Unit 4. Disregard the stranded motorist call. Caller states that he got the car running and he's all set. No officers needed. I didn't dare question it, and I didn't care to look into it. Unit 4, copy. I said through panting brass. Copy, showing you code 4. Time of call termination, 0303. I looked at the clock. It was actually 3.03 in the morning. My eyes never faltered from the clock, staring in fear until it turned. 3.04. I sighed and put my head against the headrest. I made it. I freaking made it out. I went home and called out for the rest of the night, saying that I was sick and needed to lie down. I went home and slept, pretending that it was all a bad dream. But I promise you, it wasn't a bad dream. It was real. The bullets fired from my gun were real. 
The dirt and mud caked on my patrol car is real. I think, I think I may have accidentally stumbled onto the gateway to hell. I don't know how else to describe the events that occurred, or how the time just didn't seem to change until I was free of that godforsaken road. A final note to you all, having survived what I did. If you ever find yourself in Montana, don't break down an old Route 33.